Welcome to our lecture this evening, Levinas, Vulnerability and Responsibility. Uh, our speaker, our main speaker will be Robert Berlusconi, professor in philosophy and Afri African American studies at Penn State University. He's also editor of the journals Levinas, Studies and Critical Race uh, Studies. Uh, he will be giving his lecture uh, for about 45 minutes and then uh, we will have a discussion with uh, Anja Topolsky, who is an associate professor at our uh, university in ethics and political philosophy. This lecture has been organized by Rapout Reflects, as you may have guessed, uh, but together with the Center for Contemporary Euro European Philosophy, which is uh, our uh, and with R, I mean the Netherlands' main research center for continental philosophy of all kinds of trades. I'm Simon Gusman, and I will be your moderator this evening. So please give a warm welcome to Professor Robert Berlusconi. Thank you very much for coming out this evening. Uh, if you have trouble hearing me, please just wave your hand. If you want to fall asleep, uh, just fall asleep. I don't mind. Um, very happy to be at Nijmegen, my first visit here. I uh, want to thank Anut de Goot and uh, Anja Topolsky for arranging this trip. Uh, I'm not going to try and do anything very ambitious this evening. I'm going to try and encourage you to think about the word vulnerability. Uh, certainly in the English language, the word vulnerability is becoming more and more common, more and more widespread. You see it in the newspapers. Uh, social studies talk about it all the time. I was at a huge conference in Uppsala just last month called Engaging Vulnerability, where there were just hundreds of people. Um, but I think that, in a sense, their approach to vulnerability is in danger of flattening out this word so that the vulnerable just becomes a collective noun for all the people that you want to say, ah, the poor, the oppressed, the old, the very young, the women, you know, and so on and so forth. And what worries me about these efforts, uh, when vulnerability is thought in this way, that uh, we forget why we were interested in the vulnerable in the first place. And I'm hoping that to convince you that... Uh, however tiresome it might seem at times, a philosophical approach is going to help us think more deeply and more richly about vulnerability so that whenever you see this word again in the journals, whenever you see the adverts on the paper uh, or in the, on the television which seem to be asking you to see these people as vulnerable, you think about your response to them and think about what it is, bless you, that they're trying to encourage you uh, to do. And so my talk is in three parts. The first part is going to be about uh, broadly a, uh, what you might call a Levinasian approach to vulnerability. I'll say a little bit more about the philosopher Emmanuel Levinas in a second. In the second part, I'm going to talk about a text uh, which uh, you might be surprised that it's going to be my focus, uh, but uh, I will explain in a minute. It's, the text is called the Poor White Problem in South Africa, Report of the Carnegie Commission. And this was five uh, volumes, which came out in six parts in 1932. And it was considered an exemplary application of the social sciences at that time to the problem 
of Paul White's, so-called. And yet, even though some people want to say, well, this encouraged white South Africa to embrace at least some primitive forms of the welfare state, at least for white people, uh, although that is uh, disputed by historians, it's also seen as a foreshadowing of apartheid. And so it's a very ambiguous document. Volumes on economics, on education, on society, on psychology, uh, and uh, on, one on mothers and daughters, which I guess indicates something about the time. I don't know whether it's progressive in having a volume on mothers and daughters or regressive. Depends. You have to know something about the context, um, I suppose. But the reason for focusing on this document is because I want to think, uh, I want to get access to systemic racism. And I think this will help us get there and get beyond uh, the tendency in our society to focus on individual cases of racism and discrimination. And so this will become a test case for me for how we think about vulnerability and how our responsibility arises from that vulnerability. And the other reason why I want to focus on this text, the poor white problem in South Africa, is because I believe that it can be used, given that we have the benefit of hindsight when we look at it, to help us reflect about our own times and the racism in our own times. I'm, of course, particularly concerned about how poor whites in the United States were seen to play a pivotal role in the election of Donald Trump in 2016 to the presidency. And it led many people to think that more attention should therefore be given to the poor whites, that somehow the Democrats had lost them to the, Democrat, uh, to the Republicans and so on. And I worry about drawing that conclusion from it, even though that conclusion has been drawn by many white liberals. And then in the third part, I will return to Emmanuel Levinas and give a richer account of what I believe Levinas has to tell us about vulnerability, and that's the account I want you to take home with you tonight. So in philosophical terms, the question of vulnerability appears very different, at least on the surface, from the way it appears to the social sciences and to social activists generally. The vulnerable are seen as presenting a problem that is to be solved. They are in a situation where they are at risk. They are very often the people who are most at risk because they've been ignored. One can think of Katrina and the way all the efforts to prepare for uh, this hurricane, they knew there was going to be flooding in New Orleans, they just, it didn't occur to them that there might be people who didn't have cars which would be able to drive out on their own steam. Why didn't they think that? Because they were focused only on a certain group of the population. And so that is a, therefore that leads to something which has been called the Katrina impact, and that leads to a certain way of thinking about the vulnerable. But when philosophers think about vulnerability, the first question they want to ask is, is 
vulnerability a problem that we're trying to solve? Or is it a part of the human condition? Are we aiming at a certain invulnerability, inviolability, a certain mastery, so that there, were no, there was no vulnerability anymore? But if so, how would that be attained without setting more people against each other on the way there? If you live in the flood zone, the obvious thing to do is, I'm sure you know about this in the Netherlands better than I do, uh, but you build walls to try and move the water elsewhere. But where does the water go? It goes probably to somebody else's village where they didn't want it. That's certainly the way it works if you're building flood walls on the Mississippi River, for example, where I live in Memphis. So the philosopher looks at vulnerability as something fundamental to the human condition. And I'm just going to give some indications of how uh, feminist philosophers, in particular, have taken their clue from Levinas's account of vulnerability uh, to identify certain features of it. Now, Levinas, I promised to tell you something about him, Emmanuel Levinas, uh, do you all know who Emmanuel Levinas is? Does anybody know who Emmanuel Levinas is? Uh, we've got two, two, three. I, I'll hand it over to you and I'll sit there and work. No. Um, uh, Adrian Pepperzak used to teach here from 1964 to 1968, and he was, a, was a, one of the leading, perhaps the first real scholars of uh, Levinas. So I feel like I'm bringing Coles to Newcastle and telling you about uh, Levinas. I learned a lot from him. Um, but anyway, Levinas, born in Lithuania in 1906, um, a Jew, had to leave because of the Russian Revolution, uh, moved to Straubsburg in the 1920s, studied under Husserl and Heidegger, the phenomenological tradition, um, was in a prisoner of war camp uh, in, during, during the Second World War uh, as a French officer. His family did not survive. Uh, in 1961, therefore at the age of 55, he writes his great book, The Total Ta Totality and Infinity. And this is, tends to be the Levinas that people know. And that is the idea of uh, the other human being in the face-to-face -face relation um, interrupts my self-complacency uh, and makes a demand on me to which I respond uh, almost uh, automatically, without reflection. The other puts me in question in this face-to-face -face, from a position of alterity. It's not that Levinas I'm talking about today. I'm talking about the Levinas who in 1970 published an essay uh, which you can find in a volume, Humanism of the Other Man, uh, or simply Humanism of the Other, published uh, in English translation now. Uh, the, the book actually came out in 1972. The essay is Without Identity. It's his response to the Paris uprising of 1968. And in this text, he introduces into his thinking the idea of vulnerability. He'd only used the word uh, one more time before that. Uh, and then he develops this thinking about vulnerability in his great masterpiece, The Otherwise and Being or Beyond Essence in 1974. That's what I'll be talking about, particularly in the third part of this talk. But the more simple, the more straightforward account of vulnerability that we get from those famous philosophers who have uh, lent on Levinas for their own purposes and developed another conception is a sense of vulnerability as not something negative, but as constitutive of what it is to be human, as I've already indicated. Vulnerability as a passivity, a being affected 
a sensibility, so it's not taking place at the level of reflection or of knowledge, that it is already a form of resistance. Uh, Judith Butler insists on this point in a very important essay from 2016, Rethinking Vulnerability and Resistance. And most importantly, and this is the point which I'll be developing further, vulnerability is relationality. What does that mean? Certainly within modernity, the tendency has been to assume a kind of abstract individualism. And this has been the dominant recourse of liberalism. It's very often in the name of this abstract individualism that uh, uh, one, uh, in some sense, rebels against uh, a state which is overarching in its demands. But vulnerability as relationality highlights the fact that what engages me about and in the vulnerable is how it impacts me. Vulnerability is not simply about the vulnerable. It's about the relation that I have with the vulnerable and the way that calls me to responsibility. Now, when uh, people talk about relationality, they often want to say, well, uh, in that sense, it so sufficiently overcomes the distinction between the abstract individual, the human subject, and the other, uh, that we can say that we only exist in relation to other people. That relationality is primary to any individuality. Keep that thought, and I will complicate it further, later. I promise. Uh, you probably think it's complicated enough by the reaction I got to that, but never mind. Uh, now I move to the second part. So, in the second part, I want to talk about this Paul White study put out by the Carnegie Commission. And in particular, I want to be guided in my discussion by a book that came out in 2015 by an African-American thinker, Tiffany Willoughby Harrad. She wrote a book called Waste of a White Skin, The Carnegie Corporation, and the Racial Logic of White Vulnerability. Now, her main concern in this book is trying to correct how we think of whiteness. There's been a lot of work done, particularly in the United States, under the name whiteness studies, or even critical whiteness studies. And the focus has been on white privilege and how white privilege derives from white supremacy, uh, another way of thinking about uh, racism. Uh, but she wants to correct this picture. She talks about white misery. Uh, and in this doing so, she's leaning on ideas that were developed by Franz Fanon already in 1952 in Black Skin, White Masks. And this is how she phrases her question. She's concerned with how white selfhood faces its own internalized racism, its slave past, and its self-hatred. Now, most people 
who are writing about whiteness today are not thinking in those terms about an internalized racism of whites, of a white self-hatred. But she is using this document, these five volumes, uh, to develop this thought. And although she doesn't explain clearly what she means by the racial logic of white vulnerability, I'm going to try to develop uh, in my own way what I think she must have meant by this phrase. Now you might say, well, why is the Carnegie Commission in 1932 so focused on poor whites? And of course the initial response is because black vulnerability has been normalized, has been naturalized. It's taken for granted. They don't, the white people, the Carnegie Commission, do not see any other possibility. That is how they expect the black and the colored races of South Africa to be. So why are they talking about poor whites? Not simply out of white solidarity, but because of internal divisions within whiteness. Certainly, the report is written out of a concern for the suffering, the poverty of mainly Afrikaners, almost predominantly Afrikaners, still living on the land, some of them brought into the cities, but living in extreme uh, poverty. And the existence of these poor whites represents to the privileged whites in South Africa, a threat. What is this threat? Let's think a little bit about that phrase, poor whites. And this is something the document itself, the five volumes, develops. When they think about poor whites, there are obviously distinctions being made between those non-Europeans who are also poor, who are not the object of the report, and who are not totally invisible in the report, but almost so. But on the other hand, they're thinking about those the report thinks of as the representatives of European civilization in South Af Africa, who are not the poor whites. So the poor whites are located somewhere in this middle. But as some of the non-European uh, in South Africa develop greater skills, move to the cities, uh, get better jobs, and as these so-called civilized white Europeans prosper and become richer, the poor whites appear even more desperate. And they threaten the very racial logic on which South Africa is built, the hierarchy between the Europeans and the people of European descent, and the non-Europeans. So the report talks about how uh, the poor whites, through their long continued contact with what the report calls inferior races, are having deleterious social effects on the Europeans. It refuses to say 
that the non-Europeans are becoming more civilized. It simply says they are acquiring civilized needs. But they can't stop themselves from saying that the Afrikaners in their farming methods are still primitive. So the terms are beginning to get reversed. And that is the threat. So what I'm suggesting to you is this in this report, which at least on the surface, on the first reading, it's a very long reading, I tell you, <laughs> five volumes, uh, but on the first reading seems to be about the vulnerability of poor whites. It's actually about the vulnerability of those who feel that their white privilege is being threatened because if the poor whites, as they see it, sink to the level of the non-Europeans in South Africa, the indigenous population, the colored population from uh, India and uh, Malaysia and elsewhere, then the whole assumption on which the society is built, on which their privilege depends, is no more. And of course, that's why it became necessary, in their view, in order to maintain their society, to increase the laws on segregation, to deny education to the non-European races, and eventually to develop the system of apartheid. And it is in the heart of it is the concern about poor whites. Their vulnerability, but how that vulnerability reflects on the whole vulnerability of the system of which the most privileged are the beneficiaries. So if you can see what I'm doing, what we've got to so far is when you he hear the word, the vulnerable, when you think about vulnerability, perhaps your first instinct is to think about the people that you are being shown, the photograph in the newspaper where it's saying, look at these people, send us some money. But if you're a philosopher, well, if you're my son, if you're me, Okay, <laughs> there aren't any others, I'm the only one left. It's, um, if you're a philosopher, you're going to say, ah, but how does that impact on how I look at myself? What is my relation to the vulnerable? Not just what is my responsibility towards them, but how does their very existence in our society threaten my position in society, threaten the story I want to tell about my society. You know, you, you've heard people from the United States talking about how, you know, it's all based on equality and justice and fairness and uh, all these wonderful things. And then you sort of look at the history of the country and you say, well, that's kind of weird, isn't it? But that's because, um, you know, that all gets eradicated. That does not fit the picture, right? And so all of that has to be rendered invisible. Uh, to what extent do I need the vulnerable, to what extent do I want to limit my responsibilities to the vulnerable? So now I move to the final section. So I've taken the discussion about the vulnerable and the thematization of the vulnerable to our relation to them in affectivity insensibility, and I've wanted to insist that, uh, and Levinas himself would insist, that a response to the vulnerable, 
is not only in this affectivity, it is at heart a matter of outrage, a matter of responsibility in the sense of the fact that I must have already responded. Levinas is not giving us a whole rule of ethics saying, oh, this is what you have to do. You must do this, you must do that. Uh, all of that belongs to ethics as a form of casuistry, telling you what the limits are to what you have to do. You know, uh, who is accountable for this disaster? And therefore, what kind of reparations must they pay? To what extent am I implicated? Then to what extent must I, in some way, address this situation? Responsibility in Levinas means I... Well, it means we are all responsible, but I am more responsible than the others. Responsibility falls on me. And it comes out of a sense of... Outrage. It's not about a guilt in which I want to wallow. And so, if vulnerability is affectivity, then it seems that we have to think about all the ways in our lives in which we refuse to expose ourselves to vulnerability. And how that links up with other ways of thinking about vulnerability. One of the things I often think about are the prevalence of suburbs white suburbs, gated communities, for example, in the United States. People say they go to live in the suburbs because they're afraid. They're afraid of crime. But it's not only that that they're afraid of. They're afraid of the reality of the country, the conditions in that country, which make possible for them to live in the way that they are living. So they don't want to expose themselves to the most vulnerable, and instead they think of themselves as vulnerable. That's what they say. I feel threatened in the city. Why did you feel threatened in the city? Because I saw a black man walking towards my car. What nonsense. But that is the thinking there, and it's the thinking they don't want to face a reality. I'm not saying that there isn't always... I'm not saying there's never any danger. And we can look at other cases. We can talk about terrorism. And to what extent we overreact to terrorism. If you think about... Uh, how many people have been killed by terrorism and uh, how society has turned itself upside down in order to address it. We can think about how we go out of our way to avoid uh, poor people on the street. That, that's okay, I, you can answer. It's, it's important. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't do that to you, I apologize. I just thought the talk was getting rather boring at this point, you probably, so I needed, needed a distraction. Think about borders. Borders. The classic case of how we're trying to... All the things we don't want to face, we want to leave on the other side of the border and protect ourselves from a reality that nevertheless we're living from. And so we're perfectly happy that other countries bear the burdens. But before we get too comfortable with this idea of trying to expose ourselves to vulnerability, 
And we also indicate that there is another side to this too. Uh, there's a very fine book by an African-American, uh, Sadia Hartman, called Scenes of Subjection. And she talks about how there's something almost suspicious about the way in the debates about the abolition of the slave trade, the misery of slavery was graphically portrayed. There's a narrative which just simply says, well, you know, because the philosophers had failed in their arguments against slavery, therefore we had to, you know, the abolitionists had to resort to what in the language of the day is called sentiment. Is that sentiment what Levinas is calling sensibility? I think we have to be very cautious, cautious about that because what Sadia Hartman is warning us is there may well be a sense in which white people are in some sense while being affected by these images of cruelty committed by white people, they are nevertheless getting a certain kind of enjoyment from it too. A certain kind of pleasure. Even if it's the pleasure of, that's not me. That's Sadia Hartman's argument. And so this leads me, and this is where I want to try to enrich our understanding of vulnerability in Levinas from the point at which I left it earlier, now with this example of the poor whites in South Africa to help me to recognize that vulnerability is at its heart ambiguous. We want to live in a world which is very simple and simplistic. There are certain acts that are selfish and certain acts that are selfless. There is the bad and there is the good. And we like to think of ourselves on one side of that. And our best way of doing so is to point the finger at other people uh, and think of ourselves as better than them. But what Levinas indicates in Otherwise Than Being is that there is a proximity of pain and enjoyment at the very heart of vulnerability. In which case, Sadia Hartman's observation becomes more important. Or you could think of the privileged whites in South Africa who are both disturbed by the existence of the poor whites that seem to threaten their very existence, but at the same time can insist on distancing themselves from them. They don't identify with those poor whites simply. They like to think of themselves as the civilized Europeans, distinct from the Europeans who are using primitive farming techniques. So Levinas writes, this is the only quotation I'll give you from Levinas, and I'll probably have to read it twice, and then you'll say, well, that's probably enough Levinas for tonight. But anyway, uh, this is what he says, but uh, you'll see why it's helpful to me. I've shortened the sentence. It's actually longer than the original. Um, the immediacy of the sensible is exposure to wounding and enjoyment, to wounding in enjoyment, which enables the wound to reach the subjectivity of the subject complacent in itself and positing itself for itself. Wounding, of course, is the etymology of the word vulnerability, as you know. So I'll just read it again. The immediacy of the sensible is exposure to wounding and enjoyment, 
to wounding in enjoyment, which enables the wound to reach the subjectivity of the subject, complacent in itself, and positing itself for itself. So there are three things I want to get from that quote that I want you to try and build into your sense of vulnerability that you're going to take away from tonight. And that is, first of all, that the wounding and the enjoyment are not opposites. They belong together. We can enjoy only because there is pain, and there is pain only because there is enjoyment. And the two are often interlinked. And we experience this in our lives. Like when I was, well, it was the night before last, when I was out drinking, I knew I'd have a hangover the next day, and that haunted me. So there was pain in the enjoyment. Uh, and yes, the enjoyment gave way to pain. But then I had another drink, and uh, <laughs> the pain gave way to enjoyment. But it, it's a natural transition. It's not just two opposites. That's the wounding and enjoyment. Exposure. I shall deal with complacency first. Complacency is for Levinas the very meaning of enjoyment. Or at least, enjoyment is the possibility of my complacency. And further than that, enjoyment talks to or speaks to a preoccupation with my own existence, a preoccupation with maintaining my existence, the struggle for existence, preservation in being, and of course, within society, that tends to mean for the privileged, for those who are perhaps less vulnerable, it means maintaining the status quo. That's where enjoyment lies. That's what the privileged Europeans in South Africa wanted. They wanted just simply to keep their place. If that meant they had to give a little bit of money to the poor whites or introduce laws to keep the poor whites separate from the non-European races or if it meant eventually setting up apartheid, all they wanted to do was maintain the status quo, their privilege, their supremacy. That's complacency. And that's what the other side of vulnerability, as it belongs to me as a factor of my uh, the being human, that is what is threatened by exposure. An exposure which is not simply looking at the photo in the paper, not turning the channel when the advert asking me for money comes on, that's trivial, that's neither here nor there. It's about listening. It's about reaching out. It's about putting yourself in places where you're not so comfortable. But without becoming a tourist. Without breeding a certain kind of exoticism. But above all, listening. And so this is a slightly different Levinas from the one with which I began. The Levinas of the face-to-face -face in Totality Infinity is usually referred to as the uh, other who approaches me without a name, without an identity. And this is completely decontextualized. Now for Levinas, that is in tr true at the level of the face-to-face, -face, at the level 
of ethics. But as he says already in Totality Infinity, I cannot approach the other with empty hands. And that means that if I am to respond to the other, I have to respond to the other not only at some level of transcendence or uh, desire, I have to respond to the other's needs. I have to hear how the other wants to be addressed, what matters to him or her, and not just uh, to me. And so I see my time is up, and so let me just try to remind you of what it is that I'm asking you to take home with you with this notion of vulnerability now heard, not just in terms of those are the vulnerable over there, and perhaps occasionally I feel vulnerable if I find myself in the wrong place at the wrong time, and so on and so forth, or if I lose my job, or uh, whatever it is. It's in this very relation that I have, the very relationality, which ties me to the other, but not in such a way that the other reaches into me and meets a subjectivity that is pure goodness. That if you can just get behind my egoism, the other will lead me simply to give. Because even in the act of giving, those of you who know Derrida uh, will be familiar with thoughts along these lines, but we don't need Derrida here. It's already in Levinas. There is a question about whether, uh, you know, even in the giving, don't, isn't there some pleasure in that? I, I hope so. It happens sometimes. Uh, you, and then, so how do you d distinguish the... In the giving as something which is completely selfless from enjoyment. They're part of each other. We have to be always examining ourselves uh, in the sense of being aware of our own fears, of our own vulnerabilities, of the way we try to breed fear and vulnerability in other people, as sometimes happens when people talk about immigration, and people tell you, oh, they're after your jobs, and they don't reflect on the fact that it's a system which is creating this problem. It's not these individuals who are coming in, it's the system. And we let ourselves be persuaded that it's the immigrants who are the problem because we want to maintain the system, but we don't admit that to ourselves. And so, vulnerability is not a solution. It belongs to us as human beings. We must rejoice in it, we must expose ourselves to it, we must not run away from it. Thank you very much.